Hey, everybody. Welcome. Just making sure everything is working properly. This is the first time I'm doing anything live on YouTube. So let me know in the chat if you can hear me, if everything is working okay. And get started in a minute, just so I can make sure that <laughs> I'm doing this right. It's always like nerve wracking. Looks like everything is good. Um, I'm Leslie, and this is the Authorpreneur Path. Um, I know we have moderator, Devin is in the chat with the comments, and so hopefully we can figure out a way to get questions to me, put the queue in the um, comment box so I know that it's a question. And we'll be talking about running your authorpreneur business. I'm just making sure that everything is good. Cool. All right. Um, I hope that everyone is enjoying the Author to Writing Conference. And um, a lot of good sessions happening. And I'm really excited to be with you and excited to see other people's sessions that are happening. And um, I'm going to get started in one second. Cool. So if can anyone here in the chat put in have you ever started a business before do you have any experience running a business that's kind of the stuff we're going to be going over a little bit about me i am a website developer and i'm a fantasy and paranormal romance author i'm a hybrid author so i uh, started out completely indie and i also publish with a traditional publisher i'm with my second traditional publisher now um, I'm a podcaster. My Imaginary Friends is my podcast. It's audio and on YouTube. I started my first business in 2003, and I've founded or co-founded three different LLCs, and I've been exclusively self-employed for 15 years, including the author business. So I have a web development business. I co-founded a literary magazine. I co-founded another business where we did online workshops and then my publishing business, which I started, I think, in 2014. So yeah, I have a lot of business experience. I'm a serial entrepreneur, as I like to say. Um, I've done it in different states, Maryland and Virginia. This, I'm going to be talking about the U.S., so if there's anyone outside of the U.S., I don't have any business experience outside of the U.S., um, but kind of extrapolate, you know, the different laws and different things are different in different states and different countries, obviously. So my experience is Maryland and Virginia in the U.S. But um, as far as countrywide, you know, we'll talk about things that might be different in different states and cities. And so what we're going to talk about is why be an author, an authorpreneur. I know some people don't like that name. I think it's kind of clever. I actually like using it, but those kinds of things can annoy certain people. But it's just an author entrepreneur mash the words together and you've got authorpreneur. We'll go over setting up a business. Um, financial management, organizing your business, and building out your team. So yeah, being an indie author is being a business owner, whether you really just want to write or not. Um, you kind of do have to understand that. So what is an authorpreneur and why would you want to be one? It just like, like I said, an authorpreneur is just an author entrepreneur. And you have to understand that even though writing is an art, publishing is a business. And whether you want to do it or not, whether you just want to focus on the writing and the words and, you know, stories and everything, once you take it to, you want someone to pay for your work and you're going to sell it, you become a business. So Andy Warhol said that making money is art and working is art and good business is the best art. Um, whether you like it or not, it's a business. And so adopting a business mindset is going to help you reach your goals and help you be successful. Um, there's lots of opportunities, whether you're self-published or traditionally published. And you know, no matter what path you choose, or if you're doing a hybrid of both, it's still a business. It does not mean you have to be full-time. I'm not full-time. I run my other businesses full-time and I, uh, well, I run my other business part-time now and I write part-time. And I don't, I've thought about trying to become a full-time author at different times, but I really do enjoy making websites and I enjoy having multiple streams of income and not having to rely on the books to make my income. 
and all of the other things associated with that. So regardless of whether you want it to be your full-time career or you want it to be more of a side hustle, um, still a business. So before you do anything else, before you file any paperwork or accept any money, I think that you have to define your goals. Like why do you want to be a writer? Why do you want to publish your work for public consumption? Because not everyone does. Everyone who wants to be a writer doesn't necessarily want to make money off their books. Some people have a memoir inside of them. Some people just want to do, you know, a poetry book that they share with their family and friends. So I'm assuming that you want to actually sell your, your work for money and try to get as many people as possible to buy it and read it and become a fan of yours. And so I think that deciding what success looks like is really important and to set specific goals. What do you want out of your author career? Is it money? Do you want awards? Are you looking for fan mail? Seeing your book on the bookshelves, movie deals, being on bestsellers lists? Nothing, there's no wrong answers here. And I would encourage you to dream as big as possible. So what are the reasonable goals? Um, and what are the more fantasy, like the, the things that you think are unreasonable that you're almost afraid to wish for? It's still really important to even just don't tell anybody, but give yourself permission to wish for that thing that feels impossible. You know, like I want my book to be to be made into like a Disney theme park or something like the wildest, craziest, biggest thing you can dream of. It's OK. Like I said, don't tell anybody if you don't feel comfortable, but figure out the things that are important to you. So my top three uh, goals as an author are to write the stories that I love, to not compromise my vision and to find readers who love my work. And it's important to have the goals because now I know when things get tough, when I have to make a tough decision about the path for my author career, I go back to the, the goals that I set originally and that helps me make the decision. Also, what does success look like? Um, success can be different for everyone. It is different for everyone. And so you need to know how do you know when you've gotten there? If, you're, you know, if your goal is to hit the New York Times bestseller list, that's a big goal, that's great. But what if you do, like after that, what is the next goal? So finding points of success and um, just kind of really grounding yourself in that is, is the first step. After that, you're going to set up your business. So we'll go over basic business plan, budgets and business entities. And this is kind of a high level overview. You can dig much deeper into these. And again, just want to reiterate, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an accountant. And at some stages, you're going to have to consult those people. But there's plenty of resources out there for you to get a business started. So we'll start with business plans. Now, I went to grad school and my degree is in multimedia, but it was an interdisciplinary degree between business, art and computer science. So we did a lot of um, business plan work. And even then, I didn't expect that I was going to start my own business. I didn't really want to be an entrepreneur. I sort of just kind of fell into it. Um, but I did learn about business plans. And so as authors, I'm going to go over two different kinds, a very simple kind. This is the stage one. It can be on one page. It's just an organizing document for your business. So you can create a mission statement, such as something like write and publish fantasy and paranormal romance books into the marketplace, um, or create entertainment for lovers of fantasy fiction. Those are some things that might go onto my one page simple business plan. And then figure out the strategies. So things like, are you going to be on um, Kindle Unlimited, like the uh, exclusive to Amazon, or are you going to go wide? Are you going to do only eBooks? Or are you gonna add print books? Are you going to do audiobooks? Um, or if you're going to the traditional route, it might be, you know, write the book for my agent to shop to these publishing houses. I wanna target, you know, either small presses or the big five or whatever. So those are your strategies for achieving the mission that you have delineated up front. And then the action plan. And it can just be as simple as how many books will you write a year? How will you publish them? How will you market them? Um, create a newsletter, like just bullet points even. Just something very high level to focus you and give you a little bit of direction. The next stage is a little more complicated. Um, business plan level two. So your traditional like business, business plan, it's going to be multiple pages, research, and it's up to you how deep you want to go. Um, so the mission statement, again, why are you writing? What are you hoping to accomplish overall? And then you can get into things like your ideal reader. Oops, sorry. 
I hit the mic. Um, author branding. So what does your ideal um, your ideal reader look like? That's your ideal customer. And I know that there are other workshops at this conference and there's lots of resources on, on all of these things. They could probably all be their own, their own hour long workshop at least. Um, but yeah, think about your ideal reader because you'll need that for marketing and advertising. A publishing schedule. So right now I'm doing something like two books a year and one traditional, because usually you're not going to do more than one book traditionally a year in general, and then one independently published. And that's sort of right now my schedule. Figure out what your schedule might look like. And nothing, of course, is written in stone, um, but these are the basics. Distribution channels, like I said, are you going to be exclusive to Amazon? Are you going to be wide? Are you going to think about audio, libraries? Um, if you're doing nonfiction, then there's all kinds of other opportunities to sell your book. Market analysis, looking at other authors in your genre. What are, you know, what are their pricing plans, their titles, their covers? Who's on the bestsellers list? What are they writing? It can be something like doing research so you can write to market, which is a big topic of conversation, or just knowing what's out there, knowing what your readers are going to be encountering, and how does your product measure up in the marketplace? Simple as that. Um, a marketing plan. You can do a deep dive into marketing plan, but just kind of figuring out how are you going to get the word out about your books, some ideas about that, advertising, um, social media, live events, things like that, content marketing, blogging, podcasting, all of that stuff, YouTube channels, and a financial plan. So uh, target income, how much money would you ideally like to make? Um, how much money do you think you can make the first year and then the second year and the third year, things like that? Just giving numbers, and you might not know, you might have no idea right now, but your plan can change over time. So the initial business plan is kind of putting it out there and just getting something to work from, and then you can revise and revisit it over time. And also professional development. It's really important as writers, as artists, we continue working on our craft regularly, and we take classes, read craft books, go to conferences like this, take workshops. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to achieve professional development. I like to do at least one kind of big class every year. And I go to a lot of conferences, um, whether it's in person or online. I, I have lots of craft books behind me. So professional development is really important to me. And that is something that you can put in your uh, business plan, especially if it's things that are going to cost money, like traveling to a conference, like one that happens every year, for instance. So these are just the overview of the business plan. Um, next up for planning your business budget. When you're starting, you know, when you're if you're independently publishing a book, you're going to have a budget. Same thing with when you're starting the business. There are you have to figure out how much you can afford to spend now. How much can you save to devote to your business? So if you are able to put some money away over time so that you know that you want to publish a book next year, you're writing it, it's going to take a while to finish it, to get it edited, all of that. Save up for that. Um, there's other ways to budget. You know, we can talk about bartering and things like that. But every business is going to require a little bit of money, at least, to, to start. There's fees like the, the business creation fees. If you're registering with your state or city, um, in terms of starting the business, which we'll go over a little bit more later. There's, you need a computer to write, although I know people who write on their phones, so at, at least a phone, you know, which you probably already have. Software, um, a website, and then of course, if you're self-publishing, the production fees, editors, proofreaders, cover designers, all of that stuff. Advertising, and then postage. I send out a lot of books. I do giveaways, uh, ARC readers, things like that always shipping out books, and then also the packaging supplies for those things, buying the actual books that you print. Um, and then like we said, talked about professional development. So these are just some of the things that you're going to have to spend money on. Um, and then different ways to afford it, because it can get pricey and you can do things at different pricing levels at different budgets. It doesn't have to cost a lot, but you can, like I said, save up, um, you know, make your coffee at home instead of going to Starbucks, like all those tips for people who want to save money and pay down debt. Same thing with saving money to start a business. There's also loans, there's Kickstarters and Patreon and um, like coffee, like those services for getting tips for things. 
And also you can write a book, you know, before you do any of the official business things and see if you can make some money um, on the book and then pour that money back into the business. So basically all of the money that my writing business makes, I pour back into the writing business because I have my other business that, you know, you know, my, my income and my husband's income for the other household expenses. And, you know, that's the position that I'm in that because I'm not relying on the writing for everything, which I don't suggest you do if it's at all possible, unless you absolutely have to. I do have a very close friend who was laid off from her job and she had been publishing for a couple of years at that point, but she decided to just like buck up and write to market really hard, as hard as she could, she's in romance and was able to very quickly replace the income that she had made as a teacher. And now she is a soon to be a multi six figure author. So it is possible, but your life has to accommodate that. You know, some people are, have a higher risk tolerance than others. And it also depends on what you write and all of those other things. So let's talk about business entities. And once again, this is US based. Um, so the most simple business entities are in, in this country are as a sole proprietor. A sole proprietor is just your one person. It's the default business entity. You, it's really easy to set up and to make it official. But whenever you're doing business, you're kind of our sole proprietor. And so it depends on where you are, what level you have to actually register and, you know, with your government. All the profits are on your personal tax return when you're a sole proprietor. So your income is taxed at the self-employment rate, which last I checked was about 15%, although those things fluctuate. You do not have any sort of liability protection. So you and your assets are personally potentially liable for any issues like co copyright infringement, contract di disputes, defamation suits. So if someone were to sue you for some reason, um, you're personally liable. That's why some people go to the next level, which is an LLC or a limited liability company. Usually it's a little bit more expensive, a little bit more complicated, not very complicated, but um, state to state, the paperwork and filing varies. There are fees to file in most places. Most places you can create a single member LLC, which is what I am uh, for my publishing company. I've also been a part of group LLCs. Um, and it is, it can, cre can create, it's a pass-through entity instead of uh, being taxed solo. So taxes can function like a sole proprietor, um, but it does provide a legal buffer to protect your assets. And that also varies. Like, like I said, not a lawyer, definitely check with a lawyer if you want all the details about the benefits of these things. I chose to become an LLC with my publishing company because I felt like it offered me a little bit more professionalism. It, it looks a little more professional. I wanted that layer of protection and I wanted the flexibility to maybe publish other people, although I don't think I'll be doing that anytime soon. But that was something that I thought about. The next level is S Corporation, S Corp. And it's the most complicated, it's the most um, expensive and difficult to maintain. It's also a pass through. The profits are transferred to personal income taxes in the form of salary and dividends. So that's where you pay yourself a salary. It minimizes the self-employment tax. Um, only the salary that you pay yourself is subject to Social Security and Medicare, which could be a big savings if you make a lot of money. So what I've heard is that once you are making six figures, at least $100,000, that's when you should uh, consider becoming an S-Corp. And that is something that I've heard from like big authors. So that's something to consider. But like I said, I decided to move from sole proprietor to LLC to add a little bit of legitimacy, especially when dealing with other companies and dealing with contracts, potentially sub rights, if you kind of think about selling audiobook rights, selling foreign rights as a self-publisher. Um, and it gives you additional anonymity when you're signing your contracts, if privacy is vital, so you can sign as the LLC. You can designate an attorney or someone else to sign documents on behalf of the company. And then you can publish and register your copyright under the company name if you don't want your real name out there. It is difficult to be truly anonymous, but this is one way to add another layer between your personal self and your author self or your publishing company. Um, and then it keeps your finances separate uh, from your, your business finances from your personal finances. And so in cases, also things to consider, 
if you're married and things like divorce happens, how are you going to protect your business if it's all just personal money, if it's all just as a sole proprietor, it's personal. There are just other things to think about when it comes to what kind of entity you might want to set up. So when it comes to actually forming your business, you have to have a name. Um, even as a sole proprietor, you can file a DBA, which is a doing business as in most places, as yourself or your business name. And that's kind of the fun part. I had a lot of fun brainstorming uh, business names. My publishing company is called Heartspell. And I have like notebook, a notebook with pages of just brainstorm ideas of what am I going to name my company? What, what does it mean for me, Heartspell? You know, I knew I was going to be writing fantasy and paranormal and mixed with romance and things like that. So it felt appropriate to me. And I just like the name, I got a logo made. That of course is optional. Um, yeah. So yeah, LLCs, nonprofits, S Corps are a little bit more difficult and I have never created an S Corp either. So I can't really speak too much on that, but. So with LLCs, usually you're gonna to have to file some type of articles of organization with your state. You might need a registered agent. I, I used um, LegalZoom.com to create my LLC and I use a service that is a registered agent, which just means if you ever have to get served with papers, they don't have to come to your house. Like the registered agent is on file with the state of Maryland, which is where I live and which is where I registered my businesses. And that's one of the reasons why you have a separate registered agent, although there are other reasons. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in starting a business, your local small business administration is a good resource. There's tons of information online. Places like LegalZoom will have information specific to your own state. And if you're in another country, I'm sure that there are resources like that that you can go to to get more information. Other things to do when forming the business, get an EIN, employer identification number from the IRS. If you're a sole proprietor, you would not need that necessarily, although my other business is a sole proprietor and I, I have one anyway. Um, you might also need a local or state business permit. When I lived in Norfolk, Virginia, I needed something from the city of Norfolk and also the state of Virginia because some cities are incorporated, so there's extra paperwork to do. And another thing to consider is sales tax. We're selling books. If you are planning on going to live events and selling books in person, sales tax in the place where you're selling the book might and probably will be a thing that you have to consider. So make sure you do the research on that. Often you'll have to register with the state as um, you know an entity that is required to pay sales tax. If you're going to be selling your books online, look at the regulations. They kind of do vary these days. For a long time, selling things online didn't require state tax. I mean, sales tax for the state. Some places they do now, some places they don't. So it's all very specific on location. Financial management. So we're gonna go over just bank accounts, accounting software, estimated taxes, and estate planning. All those good number of money things that people might not like to think about, but are super important. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, it is that keep your business finances separate. Have a separate bank account for your business, not going into your personal bank account. It will make your life so much easier. It will make tax time easier. It will make accounting easier in so many ways. Find a no fee business checking account. Now those are getting much more difficult to find because everyone wants to charge you fees for business checking accounts, but you can still find them. Sometimes a local bank um, or credit union will have them, community banks, online banks. Um, I can't give any specific recommendations because I'm grandfathered in through all my bank accounts since I've had my businesses for a while. But each time I started a new business, I would do the search and I would always find someone. And with more and more online banks coming on, coming there are more options for a um, no fee business checking account because otherwise, you know, you'll pay the monthly fee that you did with regular checking accounts. NOLO, I've also used NOLO also, yes, like Laura says in the comments for legal advice and paperwork and things like that. Um, so yes, having the business bank account is important. Having a business PayPal account is also something that you'll probably want to consider. Um, now, PayPal, some people have issues with PayPal. It's so many people accept it. So many 
things that you might want to do are going to, going to require a PayPal account. So having the business version, not just your personal version, important. And then if you plan to be at live events and sell in person, you probably will want some kind of device that allows you to accept credit cards like a Square uh, or a PayPal has one. There's a couple of the companies that have those uh, devices that you can get. One thing I didn't have down is um, alternatives to PayPal, um, like Stripe and other ways to accept payments online if you're going to be building an online store or something like that. So those generally don't connect directly to your bank account. They, they push the money into your checking account once you've made it. Traditional merchant accounts for other kinds of businesses are a little bit more complicated, but most of us will be able to get away with a PayPal account and a business checking account. Accounting and taxes. They're a pain, it's a headache, uh, I hate it. <laughs> So my least favorite thing to do every month is to do my accounting, but it is sadly necessary. And it's also a blessing because if you're making any money at all, then it's nice to see it. And if you're not making any money, you can you know, use that as impetus to make some money in the future, hopefully. So the reason why I like to have a separate business checking account, because then you can hook it up to software that just brings in all of your transactions automatically and spits out reports at the end of the year at tax time. You can easily categorize all of your income and expenses and it makes, <laughs> taxes are taxing, yes. It makes everything a lot easier. I use QuickBooks Self-Employed. If you're interested in that, I have an affiliate link. I've used WaveApps, which has a very robust free option. And both of these are software that, like I said, connects directly to your checking account. Um, imports all your transactions. And then once a month, I usually go through for my different businesses and categorize them. So there's the, the categories for taxes that allow you to um, have them have these expenses as deductions. Not everything, not every business expense is a deduction, but the vast majority are. And you just have to categorize, categorize them. And the software makes it very easy to do that. I also use QuickBooks for invoicing people. If, I'm, if I have to do an invoice for some reason, um, sometimes I write articles and they require me to invoice them or you know, you're providing a service for someone. So yes, you definitely want something that will easily create a profit and loss statement at the end of the year for your taxes and just make everything much more simple. And don't forget to say for your quarterly estimated taxes, you're going to have to pay quarterly taxes, um, set aside 30 to 35% of the income, the profit that you make for those taxes, which include um, income tax, self-employment tax, social security, and Medicare. And so, yeah, at, at every month I look at how much money I've made. I have a separate checking account that I just automatically divert 30% of what I made every month into it. So I, I make sure that I have enough to pay the estimated taxes, which are January, April, June, and September. And I set up a little reminder on my calendar. So pay, pay the estimated taxes, because if you're late, they charge you a uh, fee and all of that. You don't wanna play with the IRS. Estate planning. This is where it gets, we're not gonna get maudlin, but we all know we're not going to be here forever. And, you know, ignoring it is not a great idea. Like famously, Prince did not have a will. His estate is still a mess. Years later, there's so many people that don't plan for what's gonna happen when they're gone. And then they sort of just leave it on their loved ones and nobody really wants to do that. So like, you don't want that added burden. So think about what is gonna to happen to your intellectual property and your company when you are no longer here. And who is going to you know, get the money that's still for the royalties? I mean, you're, you're not here, but your books are still and they're still on sale and they could potentially still be making money. And um, you know, they could still make they could potentially be lucrative for your loved ones. So, you know, they could sell other kind of rights. People get movies made of their books after they're gone, you know? So you should at least think about it. Um, setting up a will, you know, for regular reasons, lots of reasons to set up a will, but, or a trust and designate a literary trustee, which could be, you know, a spouse, sibling, um, child, friend, or an agent or attorney. I think there are companies coming up, um, that will offer this as a service. And I think as, as more and more people self-publish and, and especially, but even traditionally published, like no matter how you're doing it, 
It's something that you're going to have to think about. Copyright lasts 70 years after the death of the creator. And you want to not just give them direction on, on your wishes, like, okay, I never want a movie made of my books. Please don't sell it no matter how much someone's offering you. Or even simply, you know, this money is coming in from Amazon. What should your loved ones do about that? Um, yeah, and I'm sure that dealing with, you know, not only all of the grief that's happening, but any, all the other business things, all the other accounts. Um, yeah, when my father passed away, it was just like over a year of kind of just unsnarling all of the things that you have to deal with. And so however you can make it easier is always a good idea in my opinion. Um, okay. Business organization. So day to day, how do we manage our business? How do we not give ourselves headaches? We wanna track our sales. We're gonna to have to do with project management for our actual writing and the book projects and then scheduling. And these are things that I'm super interested in. I love a good spreadsheet. I love software. I love tools. I love gadgets. Uh, I geek out on the stuff. I have a whole other workshop on organizing your writing life that I give. And uh, so we're not gonna to go too deep into that, but overview. You wanna know how much money you're making. That is always nice. Now you could just look in your bank account. Um, that is one way, but you're probably going to want to know what retailers are your best retailers. You're gonna to have to have some data to make decisions about your publishing business. If you're traditionally published, you wanna make sure that you're getting the royalties you're supposed to be getting and you wanna check those over. So for self-publishing, um, some people just track with spreadsheets and they download all the information from the retailers every month and they're happy with that. I love software. There's various kinds of software that you can use to track your sales. There's Book Report, which is for Amazon only, but it's very easy to use. I use Book Report and Scribe Count. So since my self-published stuff is wide, it's at multiple retailers, Scribe Count is a software that allows me to easily connect automatically to all of those retailers and pull down my sales report. So I can always know, you know which retailer is doing well, I had a bump in you know, Barnes and Nobles or Apple or something like that. And then you could make marketing decisions based on that. There's also some software called Publish Wide and Book Tracker that I think I used Book Tracker a million years ago and I don't think it's been updated since then, but some people really love it. I'm not familiar with Publish Wide, but Dave Chesson at, at uh, Kindlepreneur did a nice overview um, on these different software and Scribe Count came out on top is my favorite as well, but you can definitely try different ones to see which one you like the best. Project management. Um, so there's so many things that go into your author business from writing the actual book and organizing yourself to do that to hiring editors, cover designers, uh, organizing arc teams and beta readers and then publishing and then marketing and ads, like it goes on and on. And even with traditional publishing, I'm constantly interfacing with my editor and publicist. Um, there's events, there's articles they want me to write to do marketing. There's just a lot of things with that too. It's, you know, indie publishing is hard. Traditional publishing is hard for different reasons. There's different tasks that you have to do, but you still need a way to organize it all. So this is just a list of different project management systems that I think I've tried all of these. <laughs> Um, I'm a big, a big fan of Trello for Kanban boards, but um, right now I'm using ClickUp for project management for both my website development business and my author business. And it's just a matter of like inputting all the tasks that I have to do and then categorizing them and putting dates on them so I can see them on a calendar. I'm really enjoying that. I like a good Gantt sheet. Actually, I think I have some. Yes. So Trello is just, you know, this is just screenshots of different ways you can visualize all of your projects. You might be familiar with Gantt sheets um, from regular work stuff. I like that for, for certain kinds of scheduling. I like a good Kanban board for organizing. However it works, whether you like sticky notes um, on a board or totally manual, up to you. But think about as you're doing your business planning, how are you going to organize all of the different tasks that it takes to run a business, to keep it running, keep from running it into the ground, all of that. And then production schedules. So this was my production schedule for the first half of 2019. And I found this layout of a calendar that I really liked so that I can get that sort of 
overview of what I'm writing when. So basically what these colored blocks are, are different stages of different books. And um, I colored, I think, you know, editing is one color. And then when the book was with the, with the editor, it's a different color. And then when I'm promoting it, it's uh, a different color. So I was working on, looks like three or four books during those six months. I have due dates for different things. Some are shorter than others. Some are long, some are indie, some are traditional. And I, I did this at the beginning of the year to plan how I thought the year might work. Of course, it didn't work out this way at all, but at least I had a sort of a high level overview of the of what I thought I, sh I needed to be working on, you know, what stage of which book I needed to be during what month. And now I do this every year and I never stick to it, but it's always helpful to at least try. So however it works for you, going back to the business plan, okay, how many books were you planning on writing? How are you going to just to organize that and split it up and figure out to how you're actually going to get it done. Then because my cover designer is super busy, I book him six or seven months in advance. Editors, you have to book in advance, all of these people. So those create the deadlines. With my traditionally published books, my editor gives me a deadline and I try to meet it. And if I can't, I push it back, but you know, all that stuff. Production scheduling is super important. <laughs> Of course, there's also planners, bullet journals, things like that. Sarah Cannon is speaking here at the conference. She's wonderful. I took her HB90 bootcamp class. I highly recommend it if you are feeling overwhelmed with how to organize yourself. I started bullet journaling. So I like redundant systems. I have paper systems. I've got software systems that do similar things so that I hopefully don't forget, knock on wood. Um, and then there's kind of just different different stages of life where I'm really into doing everything, like scheduling every moment of my day and other stages when it's a lot more lackadaisical and I'm just like, okay, I've got a list on a sticky note somewhere and that's, that's the best I can do today. Um, my point is basically just have a system, try different systems, find something that works for you to organize your business. Uh, because as you know, most of us are going to be solopreneurs, we're going to have a team around us. If you're self-published, you know, it's not really yourself, uh, but you have to manage that team. And so you have to be, have some level of organization to do that. Speaking of which, oh, keep a record of your book information. So I created a publication database, basically. So all of my books I have between novels, novellas, short stories and anthologies. I actually don't know how many books that I have, oh, like over 12. And I just needed a way that when I'm, you know, posting on social media, I needed to grab the information quickly. So I highly recommend creating, whether it's a spreadsheet or, you know, some other kind of more robust database, something with all of this information in it that you can access very quickly and get the links, get the ISBN if you need it, get um, a quote, you know, ad copy, the keywords that you update in, in Amazon, the blurb, all that stuff in some place. I started using Evernote originally for this. Now I use a software called Notion. It can be whatever you want. It can be a text file somewhere. Just keep that record. Having that uh, close by and easy to access, super helpful in all kinds of situations. All right, building the team. Talked about collaborators and contracts. So both indie and traditional. This. These are people who might be on your publishing team. You're going to have multiple editors, proofreaders, cover designers. You might have an interior designer or a formatter. You might have assistants, um, a website, web designer, accountant for taxes, lawyer. I do have a lawyer for certain things. I actually did my first traditional deal with a lawyer because I did not have an agent at the time. And so my, I had an entertainment, um, a literary lawyer who negotiated all of that. I do have an agent now. I have publicists through my, my publisher, but there are independent publisher, publicists. I work with the publisher. Um, some people work with translators, co-writers, beta readers. All of these people are on the team. And like I said, you'll be managing them in many cases, or at least managing the relationship. So a lot to a lot of balls that you have to juggle to keep keep the publishing train going. Too many metaphors. So a, a common question is how do you find these people? How do you find good designers, good editors? 
the number one way I like to do it is through recommendations from other authors and specifically authors in your genre. So when I was first deciding to self-publish, I, and I was writing an epic fantasy. So I was reading epic fantasy and I would, um, you know, be in groups with other fantasy authors, asking for recommendations. There's all kinds of Facebook groups, um, Discord, Slack channels, things like that. So hopefully you you have some kind of community or you can find some kind of community of other writers so that you can ask directly for recommendations. Another thing that I would do was look in the acknowledgements of books because often the editor, the designer, those people are thanked in the acknowledgements. So if I, I found a book whose cover I really loved and wanted to find out who did it, I would start stalking that book. I would read the acknowledgements. I would check out the author's website because sometimes they will thank their designer or their editor on their blog or their website. Um, and then of course, there's also directories like readsy.com where people, um, service providers like editors and designers will list themselves and you can go through and find um, virtual assistants. Everybody who's on that list in the slide before you can find on a, on a directory like that. So those are just some of the ways that I've done it. I've worked with several different um, indie editors, a couple of different cover designers. And yeah, these are, these are the ways that I found them, either asking in a group or seeing a name referenced in something that I loved. When you work with people, you should have some kind of contract. Um, whether it's an editor or a designer, um, having a contract, it doesn't have to be official. You don't have to hire a lawyer. I mean, a contract is sort of official, but I'm saying you don't have to hire a lawyer to make contracts. There's plenty of online resources for contract templates. And as long as it really says what they're doing for you, how much you're going to pay, when it's supposed to be due, who owns it is very important, specifically with artists, cover designers. There are some cover designers that will give you the copyright of the art, and there are other designers who will keep the copyright, but give you a license to use the art as a cover, which means if, you, if you're licensed to use the art as a cover, in general, you wouldn't be able to like sell t-shirts of the cover or sell no, you know, notebooks or something. If you own the copyright for the artwork, sometimes you'll pay more because that's very valuable for the artist, but you can do whatever you want with it. And that really depends on the artist and what their preference is. So even if you don't technically own the copyright, that, you know, that license, that unlimited license to use the book cover covers you for just regular book activities. But it's important to know what the artist wants. And then also the contract should have what happens when things go wrong. If dates aren't met, um, if revisions go over what's planned for, like many cover designers will say, you get three rounds of revision because they don't want you coming back to them every day with something to change. Otherwise they're not gonna be making any money and this thing will go on forever. So if you go through your three rounds and you want one more change, you know, things like that should be in the contract that you have. And then what happens if you have a disagreement, a lot of contracts will have like arbitration clauses or something like that. So that's, like I said, there's plenty of sample contracts uh, I usually do that if my designer or whomever doesn't have their own, then you can find something that you both can agree on. And it will just save you some, um, some grief and drama. And then with traditional publishing, I have a, a contract with my agent. So, um, and it, it just goes over things like what kinds of work do they get commission on? My agent doesn't get commission on like the anthologies that I'm a part of that someone asked me to be in. You know, uh, they only get the commission on the work that they sell. So you have to be really clear because there are shady agents out there and they will try to take, they will try to take, you know, 15% of whatever you're doing, regardless of whether they were involved in it or not. And you really don't want to sign those kinds of contracts. It should say the amount of time that the contract lasts, um, how the money is distributed, who gets the money. A lot of times agents will want to be paid first and then they'll pay you. And that obviously is advantageous to them. Um, things like that to, just to be uh, make sure you consider. And then how to terminate the contract. And things like if you are on submission and you terminate your contract with your agent, they would still receive the money for X number of months if they sell the work that you know they had started to work on, but they didn't finish because you terminated your relationship with them. So there's all kinds of details like that that you have to be careful of when you're signing with an agent. And then a publishing contract 
which are huge. They're like 30 pages long a lot of times. Uh, they're so detailed. I do recommend if you can afford it, uh, get a lawyer to review it. Agents are not always lawyers. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they have lawyers in their agency, but sometimes they don't. And so then, you know, definitely things to think about the rights that they're getting, how long, when do you get them back, how much are you being paid for each each format? You know, there are different percentages for different, like audiobooks pay at a different rate than hardcovers and ebooks and paperbacks. Is there a non-compete clause? Which if you're hybrid is really important. And is there a morality clause? Those are becoming more common these days and those are scary because I hope it's obvious why a morality clause would be scary. Like who would get to determine if you were doing something immoral in their eyes? Try to stay away from those. How do you terminate? Can you terminate? And how could you get your rights back if you wanted to? Um, so there's a question about, is it true that traditional publishing pays in four increments? It can be three or four. My contracts have always been three, although I've heard that four increments is more common. So mine are, I get one third when I sign the contract, I get the second third when I turn in the book and it's accepted by my editor. And I get the last third when the book actually publishes. Um, I'm trying to think what the fourth one would be. I, I don't know because I haven't done that, but there's another way to split it up where you get four payments instead of three. And that's why even with traditional publishing, even if you were to get like a hundred thousand dollar deal, like a, a six figure deal, which is great and more and more rare. From the time you sign the contract to the time the book comes out can be a year and a half often. So take out 15% for an agent, split $100,000 into two or three years. And it's a lot of money, but it's not enough to live on for most people. So, and if it's for, if it's for, if they push the publication date back, like there's all kinds of reasons why living off of royalties can, uh, off, of, off of an advance can be difficult. Other things to consider, just some miscellaneous things I threw in to think about for running the business, um, whether or not you want to purchase ISBNs. Years ago, and this was like 2014, when I first started publishing, Balker, who is where you buy your ISBNs in the United States, had a sale. It was the last time they've had this sale. And uh, so yeah, eight, eight years have gone by since then. But 100 ISBNs, and I can't remember how much it was, it was still a lot of money but it was 100 ISBNs, and whereas one is $250. So most people are not, I think that's the right amount of money. Most people are not buying ISBNs because they are so expensive here, but um, there are reasons why you might want to consider it. Or you can just take the ones, obviously, that come from the publish the distributors. Are you going to register your copyright with the copyright um, office? Or are you going to rely on the sort of default copyright? There are good reasons to register. Uh, it can be a pain. Things about thinking about piracy. Are you going to go after potential pirates or just kind of have a laissez-faire attitude about it? Trademarks. You can't trademark. Um, you can. There are certain things that you can trademark. You can't trademark like book titles, but world, the names of worlds or series titles, you could potentially trademark if you wanted to make money off of that. Buying 10 ISBNs. I chose to buy ISBNs because I felt like, again, I wanted to really be as professional as possible. Um, they're free in Canada. They're free in England, I believe, also. Uh, so and it was another thing where, you know, I could afford it, especially with the sale. If it hadn't been that sale, I probably would have bought 100, but it made it, it, made it worth it. I cut it down to something like, I can't remember, honestly, because it was so long ago. Um, but yes, they are ridiculously expensive in the United States. Other things, um, a re regular business review, review your business plan at least every year and just see, see if you're on track, see if your goals have changed, if your strategies or tactics have changed, if something has changed out there, like some new thing has come in, um, you know, KU didn't always exist and then it existed and now people, it's changed the game for a lot of people in their, in their businesses. And think about adopting a long-term mindset which is, do you want to do this for a long period of time? Do you want to publish, you know, how many books do you think you have in you? And if the number is you can't count them, then your business should have a long-term mindset as well, just so you will have that foundation to keep publishing for as long as you want to and as long as you're able to. I have a long list of tools and resources. Um, you can go to 
lpen.co slash resources. I think I can put that in the chat. Um, if you're interested in some of the tools that I use and if you wanted to try some of them. All right. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's a lot of things to think about, a lot of things that are, are possible to, to do. And, you know, you don't have to use them all at once. You can kind of start small and then expand as the need arises. You know, I didn't start out using all of these, but I found them useful in my business over the past seven years that I've been publishing. All right. I have a quote from Jay-Z. <laughs> I'm not a huge Jay-Z fan, but I thought this quote was nice. And do you have any questions for me about any of this? I really do enjoy the business and I like, I like, I'm a control freak as many people are who are self publishers, but I also do really enjoy having a traditional publishing side as well. And yeah, I think that Starting out, knowing that I wanted to have my self-published books be indistinguishable from self, from traditionally published books felt like the right the right move for me, and I think that it's yielded really good results in my career. And so, hopefully, this has been helpful for you guys. Um, those of you thinking about starting actual official businesses with your writing, whether you're ready to do that right now or you're going to do that in the future, um, I hope that this you got something out of this. How do you find conventions to attend? A lot of that for me has been genre-based. Since I started, I always wrote fantasy, but I discovered RWA back in the day. And so I got involved in that. I'm not longer involved in RWA. If you've heard anything about RWA over the past few years, you may or may not want to do that. But whatever genre you write, um, there's also local organizations. I'm in Maryland. There's Maryland Writers Association. There are all kinds of and then of course, online, there's other groups too. So I would start with your genre and try to find a group that caters to your genre and or just a local writing group in your area if there are any or an online writing group that um, might you know be other writers at a similar level as you are. That's always helpful, especially you know if you don't have a community right now. How did I land my literary agent um, for my traditionally published book and what genre was it for? My first book is epic fantasy. I, I wrote a four book epic fantasy series, Earth Singer Chronicles. And I wasn't even thinking about getting an agent because I had the, the deal. You know, I did the deal with the lawyer. And so I was like, why do I need an agent? But my editor at St. Martin's Press said that you should probably get an agent to handle the business stuff so you can focus on the writing. And so she gave me a few suggestions of people to contact but I actually got a recommendation from another writer who was at a, a workshop that I was at. So I was at a, a week-long writer, writer's workshop, also good places to network. And we were in a Facebook group together. So I was like, I need an agent. And she was like, oh, my agent's great. You should talk to her. So that ended up being the agent that I went with from, an, from a recommendation from another writer. Um, yeah, and she does fantasy and romance. And it's basically a fantasy romance book. But you know, finding an agent is like a whole a whole thing. If you can have recommendations of people, and just because someone's like, oh, talk to my agent, it's not obviously a slam dunk. It's just, they will they might be able to tell your agent, hey, I know this writer, consider them. And that gives you a little bit more of a foot in the door than just being in the slush pile. But, you know, submitting your, your, your work to agents traditionally is just how it goes. If there's a mentor program, um, you know, pitch wars just ended, but things like that. There's other mentorship programs, especially with genre-based groups. So I know that like CIFWA, Science Fiction Fantasy Writers, has a mentorship program. I'm not sure the because to be in CIFWA, you have to have certain publication credits, but I think, I'm not sure if the mentor requires that or not. But other organizations like that might have other ways to find, find agents and to network with authors who might also be able to recommend you to their agent and things like that. Um, yeah, so just a reminder to like the video. In the description, there is the playlist for the rest of the conference and also the giveaway, the feedback form, all that good stuff, links galore. If you're interested in more of my thoughts on publishing, I am doing the networking at 9 p.m. Eastern tonight. 
You can always check out my podcast, My Imaginary Friends, which is weekly behind the scenes look at publishing. And unless anyone has any more questions in our final minutes, I will move off of that. Um, let me know. Thank you guys so much. Do you think it's necessary to learn screenwriting if you want to do an adaptation? If you want to adapt it yourself, then yes. I think you would have to read some screenwriting books at minimum, also read a lot of scripts. Uh, my, I have an undergraduate degree in film production, so script, script writing and book writing are different enough to be not as easy to cross over as you might think. So yeah, if you, if you want to adapt your book yourself, then I would definitely recommend educating yourself as much as possible on screenwriting. If you just want it to be adapted, then chances are, you know, even if you do the research, chances are you're not going to adapt it yourself. If you say you sell your book to a TV or film production company, uh, most of the time they're going to bring in other writers. Although you're seeing more and more authors adapting their own work. And so not to say it doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, there are very different disciplines. So read a lot of scripts and then you'll get the feel for what you might need because it's a whole nother world. <laughs> All right, you guys, I will let you take a break for the next, the next presentations and yeah. Check me out at the networking. I'm, I'm going to be on tomorrow also at 7 p.m. Eastern. And I hope that you all have great success in your writing careers and your author businesses and that you all uh, are terrifically successful entrepreneurs. <laughs> Good luck to everybody. And thank you guys so much.